Thank you for joining us at the Connected Virtual Tech Event today. Um, what can one say about Luke Lucas that hasn't already been said? Um, I, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to uh, introduce our keynote panel. Um, Lori Caruso from Safe Tech will be doing the interviewing. Lori is our uh, podcasting partner. Um, we will be launching that series soon. And Luke Lucas jumped in. We had a, uh, uh, a speaker from Facebook who at the last minute was not able to be with us. Um, and uh, sometimes in these big companies, that stuff happens. Uh, but um, it, by no means do we have a second rate substitute. We have a first rate uh, participant here with us today in Luke Lucas. Um, I want to thank uh, Zenfi for being the sponsor of this uh, part of the event. And uh, also want to encourage all of you to go and visit the exhibit booths and chat with the uh, folks that are in the exhibit booths that are um, there waiting to talk with you. And also the uh, other chat rooms that are, are uh, available through the lounge. Um, and so I think um, so far the event has been terrific. The panels have been great and the feedback we've gotten has been really, really interesting. So. Um, I do want to again thank both Lori and Luke for handling this today. And uh, I'm sure we will have a lively and interesting conversation. And um, without further ado, Lori, the floor is yours. Luke, thank you for being with us today. Hello, thank and thank you, Rich, for that. I appreciate it. It's always lively when we have Luke on, that's for sure. Right, Luke? Let's have some fun this afternoon, Lori. Let's have some fun. That's what it's all about. And plus, yeah, I'm sure everybody's like gone through all these panels and they're like, all right, we just need some sort of lively pick me up besides coffee, right? And hey. we don't have a show now to go get the coffee at the table. So let's just liven it up this way. How's that? Sounds great. So Luke Lucas from T-Mobile, who is the Senior Manager for National Engineering and Business Development. It is a pleasure to have you on. So excited that you could make this. Thanks for the invite, Lori. So actually, one of the times, it's been a while, but I remember back in the end of February, maybe March time frame when you and I connected, we were talking about, I don't know, going to a show. And then all of a sudden you're like, I can't travel. It's not gonna work for me because of COVID. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Wow, look at us now, crazy. And you absolutely called it, Luke. It's you know, 2020, we jumped into it pretty quickly. Uh, you and I typically have a, a brisk travel schedule each and every year. Um, surprisingly, when our, at that time, COO, Mike Sievert, sent out a note the first week in March that said, hey, um, I think I'm going to cut travel back immediately. We're going to start doing some different things. Um, there appears to be some kind of a health risk. And I was looking at myself going, well, we're, probably in back in flu season. So it's probably something similar. And, and it certainly doesn't, it's not contrary to travel. So like you and I chatted, it wasn't going to affect us. Well, the following week, boy, it was take your laptop, take your power charger and work from home. And of course, you know, engineering groups, especially T-Mobile's engineering group, were very used to virtual or uh, used to working from home or remotely. So it was second nature to us. Obviously, the rest of the company had to catch up. Absolutely. Yeah, the whole world pretty much changed in a matter of, I don't know, weeks, so to speak. So in addition to the changes with that with COVID, but also T-Mobile went through some pretty major changes as well. You want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, boy, you're not kidding. Uh, so uh, obviously, before we got into the new year, we were working through the federal lawsuit with uh, the attorneys general's trying to get approval for the Sprint merger. And of course, luckily the judge sided with us. So in December, when we launched our 600 layer cake for 5G, um, we had no idea what the roadmap was gonna be, but we knew that in and around April, we'd be closing Sprint. So we jumped into the year, as you remarked earlier, we immediately then started to kind of see a different landscape for 2020 as we hit March. Um, we started going to pre-closure with Sprint and April 1st, no fooling, we actually closed the transaction. The following week, we went out to the financial market and raised $26 billion in addition to the amount that we did to close Sprint. All that became very tricky because uh, with COVID, the financial market started to freak out, um, but we got it done and we put it into high gear. The plan is very robust. I 
think we've got five different markets now on 2.5 band. Um, so we've really accelerated that program. We're still continuing the 600 layer, um, but you know, we're building our, our layer cake, our wedding cake. So uh, 5G is fun, exciting, challenging at the same time, um, you know, with the global issues happening, uh, the pandemic present, and, uh, but otherwise we're working through it. Well, I have to commend you know, leadership and, and what they were able to accomplish, given the fact that, you know, following it for as long as we were following it, and to see as many challenges that you faced and as many milestones as you had to achieve to get to where you were today or are today to, to obviously take on 2.5 and merge with Sprint, it was pretty impressive, I have to say. Well, you know, at T-Mobile, we're the end carrier. So we're very centric to the customer's needs. Um, as you may have read in the press, we started, we went to the FCC and said, hey, we need to even borrow Spectrum. And today, although many partners under the FCC pledge are starting to release those, those acknowledgements, um, we're still continuing. So we moved from a zero cost model of borrowing spectrum to supplement our spectrum so that the customer experience is, is completely perfected. Um, you know, we're still continuing to do that because we know that the customer experience is absolutely wireless is about. Yeah, I mean, we were talking, obviously, we've had so many great discussions on our panels today, whether it's, you know, CBRS, whether it's, you know, deploying and, um, you know, going forward with new technologies and 5G. I mean, there's clearly something that needs to happen. We are moving at the speed of light here. And with the technology having to change as much, you need to make sure you've got spectrum, you've got bandwidth, you've got capacity. And so, you know, obviously with the addition of your 2.5 and your 600, your so-called wedding cake, so to speak, which I love that coin little, the term there, um, it's important. It's important for growth. It's important to see these carriers obviously be able to do that just the same way. What are some of your other initiatives, given the fact that you've got all this now? What, where are you going now? What's happening with T-Mobile for the future? Well, you might remember as, as part of the federal lawsuit, we also started a new T-Mobile uncarrier. And uh, uncarrier to us is an initiative that takes the pain points away from the customers, whether it's conscious or subconscious, all the customers in wireless over the years have had pain points. So the uncarrier initiatives really drive away those pain points. So, you know, we looked at the spectrum piece as a way to perfect the experience. Um, and then we've now started several initiatives. So the first three that we had um, was our connected heroes, it's 10 years of connected uh, access for public uh, first responders, public safety and first responders. Second, we had our 10 million initiative, which is zero cost broadband uh, to folks that are disenfranchised. They don't have access to the internet today. We know that access to the internet is critical. And as unemployment rises, people need the internet. They have to apply for benefits on the internet. They have to make applications for jobs on the internet. The internet is a critical vehicle for everybody's daily life. So, um, you know, we've been supporting that. And last but not least, then we offered, in addition to the 10 million um, uh, broadband connections, then we also initiated a $15, which is really probably the lowest cost of a broadband connection um, and to support that. So off to the races with those three initiatives at the start of the year. And then we've just literally launched um, in the last week um, our scam shield. And I'm just getting used to that name, but everybody is sadly uh, receiving robocalls. And if you own a mobile device or multiple devices, uh, millions and millions and millions of robocalls are being generated every single day. So with enhanced software and at no cost to the customer, it applies to both Sprint customers now on the T-Mobile network and the T-Mobilers, um, we are now shielding those calls. So it's either scam likely that's showing up on your phone on display or the call is blocked completely. So, you know, all the pain points we continue to work on diligently, but we've got to have the network. It's all about the network, it's connectivity, it's always connected. And so, you know, all these initiatives wrapped into one, it's a busy day job. It sure is, Luke, no question. So with all of those initiatives, I am gonna dive deeper into them. So hopefully you're okay with that because I do have so many questions, so to speak. But one of my right. big questions to a carrier, when we were hit with COVID, 
and we saw literally the displacement of people going into a city now going and staying at home and most of those people live within a you know 60 mile radius so to speak so your networks where you're so used to having capacity challenges and bandwidth issues and everything in these cities now empty and now you need to focus on these rural areas that you might not have coverage but you, you have that customer that has that t-mobile phone how did t-mobile take on that challenge so quickly how did you work it out to make sure your customers were okay? Well, in a simple answer, it's the base of our layer cake for 5G. Launching uh, December 12th, 2019, our 600 band layer now applies 5G to rural as well as suburban and, and of course urban. So really that's been the, the timely fix all for everybody. Now there's a limited number of devices in the marketplace, but the device numbers are growing. And certainly late this year, we're going to see, um, with hopefully no supply chain issues, Apple coming, you know, to the marketplace with their 12 product. Now people have that access to the 5G layer. Now, was 5G on 600 really a speed play? No. We built that solely for the penetration, for the coverage. We want to get rid of the white space. And the only way to do that with coverage is to get as low as you can on the broadband spectrum and make sure that you've got ample signal. So with that ubiquitous coverage being launched in December, uh, sun and moon alignment, I, I must tell you, senior leadership have all their ducks in a row, literally to be ready, coincidentally in this case, for a global pandemic. So. Yeah, because, uh, you know, unfortunately now that we've seen this, most haven't, you know, I've ever lived through something like this. Now we're on guard because we have no idea when uh, things will change in our future. And if it ever, ever happen again, or will it get better? I mean, the uncertainty exists. So, and, you know, communication drives certainty, you know, so they can feel comfortable when they're traveling that they have that coverage. So it, it's critical. And I, I know that you guys were completely engaged with that. And I saw that actually coming through. So it worked out worked out to the benefit, but we all still have to play some sort of part of where we're going with this for sure. So I have to ask too, I know you were just talking about supply chain and just another question. I'm actually on a panel tomorrow for supply chain, which we've seen challenges with because of COVID and not being able to get handsets because they're manufactured overseas. Uh, you know, we're waiting for in building solutions to be deployed and it's being, you know, literally stopped in its tracks because we have so many delays. How are you guys working through supply chain management and the issues that we're seeing with it? Well, to address the supply chain side on that side of the shop, and I'm part of the procurement group at the moment, um, that literally, what we did was we looked at best practices and with the incorporation of the Sprint Legacy team uh, here shortly in the next month, where we're gonna be the new T-Mobile and then T-Mobile going forward, um, we saw that the Sprint team had a better procurement side. And so we have worked diligently to put that in place. Um, it also then commanded a different presence um, in the marketplace. How are we communicating with the vendors? Are they single source? Are they multiple source? How are their sources doing? And so we've literally gone through and kind of peeled back the onion more so than ever on the procurement chain because if we're not in communication with the absolute whole string of people that are involved on delivering us products, services, and goods, um, then there's going to be a failure. And if we're on the receiving end of waiting for that, then that breaks down our delivery and our promise to the customer for customer perfected you know, signal. Yeah, it's important. It's definitely a challenge. I hear it constantly out there that they're having challenges to be able to bring that equipment in. So now also another initiative that you have, and I want to dig into this a little further because we have a lot of enterprise customers um, joining us today, commercial real estates here. Um, we have buildings that we're looking at, obviously, infrastructing with coverage. And I know T-Mobile, you've always played a big part with joining DAS systems and networks. But I also know too that, you know, you've had to make some changes because it, it's costly. It's extremely costly to be able to join these networks, especially if third party operators are involved in their ownership. You know, you had to kind of change and adjust, so to speak, but still deliver the coverage that you needed. And your build your own coverage, so to speak, network, BYOC, 
not BYOD to be exact, BYOC, because I've been in the industry a long time and I remember that term. Talk to me a little bit about what you're doing to bring coverage into these networks, into these buildings. Okay. Um, well, a, a, as you know, Lori, six years ago, I conceived this program. We, we knew that the final frontier was coming. 80% of the calls are generated and, and indoors today. Everybody expects coverage everywhere all the time. Um, and we knew that from, as, from a CARES perspective, um, it was going to be a pretty tall mountain that we would have to climb if we were still writing checks um, to participate. So we built a utility-like model. Uh, the enterprise of the government works diligently with a strategic partner. They put the equipment in. They pay for it either through finance or through cash. Um, once that's in place, then we bring our FCC license signal, and in most cases, the broadband requirement, the fiber, back to our switch. Um, that program has taken off. Everybody at now has engaged with that. We have over 128 partners um, stateside. Um, we are now 500 projects deep this year, where we didn't even believe that we would probably be hitting that type of a number from an intake perspective with submissions. So we know it's on the, on the forefront of people's minds. We know that they need coverage solutions indoors. Um, we're trying to engage and coach them into opportunities that may or may not involve us. Um, in some cases, it might be a repeat, repeater type opportunity where they're capturing the signal. And I think, you know, from a perspective from engineering, and I'm probably speaking to the engineers in the audience for a moment, um, you know, there's two ways to deliver satisfaction to the customer in our mind. One, it's cell sites and the number of cell sites that you have. Second, it's spectrum. And you can flip that model around and say, I have more spectrum. More spectrum then gives you that opportunity for less cell sites. So when we deployed the 5G band, and it kind of takes us back to the prior conversation, the 5G on 600 band was really meant to penetrate a number of areas that we truly today did not get to. So you didn't have a T-Mobile signal when you went into certain locations. Now, we're still challenged with lead certification and certain construction material type buildings. That is the wave of the future. A number of people are still doing that for cost, energy, efficiencies, and savings. That's still going to be a challenge. Those owners, operators, property operators, those people are going to need indoor solutions, absolutely. But if they don't have that type of construction, they're an older type of building that's not brand new, fresh, right out of the ground, under lead certification, then they probably still have a chance to still capture our six band, 600 band signal. Um, and of course, we're using the 2.5 that we acquired a clean uh, amount of spectrum from Sprint to actually be the 5G layer. So all of those things comprised really are the base of build your own coverage. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're in sync. It's a collaboration with the partners. And all day, every day, we want to make sure that there's solutions being offered, even if it's minimum coaching that we're giving to the property operator so that they can come up with a plan. And of course, we've built some checklists around that at tmobilebyc.com. What we're trying to do is really spur the industry on the in-building space. So whether they're competitive partners or not, we're still trying to make sure that the marketplace is served indoors. Well, it's it, it's a critical place to be. I mean, obviously, if you don't have indoor coverage with these lead buildings, low E glass, and you can't penetrate back into that building, you're going to lose customers, you're going to have issues. I mean, it's a clear issue out there just to be able to do it. But again, it comes down to cost as well, right? Um, especially now we are we are watching like hospital systems, so to speak. Um, you know, they are cutting costs left and right. They're losing money left and right, but they also have to operate. And the only way to operate is to have that connectivity. So say for instance, and I know we do a lot of enterprise work with you, but say for instance, you did have a hospital come to you and say, okay, this is our situation. We have no money, but we need to have a system. What do we do here? What's the next step and what's the process? Well, we really encourage them, Lori, to find a strategic partner, somebody that's going to be a long-term partner for them, that's going to be the speed dial um, when and where they need technology. Once that's in place, um, the carriers then become that sub-partner, that, that person or that company behind the curtain. And so the carriers then support that strategic partner with the hospital. Um, the hospitals today, though, at least the ones that I'm aware of here in Seattle, um, you've got a stage in the parking lot. You've got to fill out your documentation in your car. 
you got to wait for a text, you go into queuing, and then of course it, it goes from there. So we're acutely aware that medical is, is probably the first and foremost, secondarily education, uh, trying to get the kids back to school and engagement. And of course, most school districts, we've seen what's happened in Los Angeles and others that are kind of leading the charge that they might not be back this year. So it brings us back to the, the residential life and, and the connectivity there. So, you know, it's a challenge that we've all been looking forward to, a challenge that we didn't think we would have such a great amount of interest in it. But, you know, literally COVID has brought it to the forefront of everybody's mind. So every, every site, last comment, um, every location we consider as custom. There's nothing really off the shelf that we can offer. So we really have to play an engagement role to be that coaching partner and to make sure that the strategic partner and us as a coaching partner are aligned with that property operator. Well, it's important too. I mean, you're only one person. Your team, you know, is only, you can only have so many people on your team from a resource perspective. So you really need to be able to rely on partners heavily, I would imagine, to be able to strategize with the end user, be able to build something as far as, you know, the overall technology strategy, so to speak, and then work with you to align, to be able to bring that to the future, so to speak. Well, I, I think there's a new wrinkle to that. So last year, as we all know, um, the CBRS was approved and kicked off with Ongo. And so at, that's another tool in the toolbox that we see that is very promising, is very opportunistic. Um, the enterprise can be in control of their own future if they want to be. I think it really boils down to goals and objectives that they need to write out for themselves, make a determination of what are they problem solving for? And once they determine that path, then they've got an initial starting point. Um, security, uh, sensors, whether it's IoT or formerly known as as end-to-end or machine-to-machine that have been around for years. A long time. Way, uh, literally, uh, wayfinding. Um, maybe it comes down to a compliance issue, which has kind of a related uh, COVID spinoff, where companies will need to take your temperature, they'll need to record it, um, they'll need to make sure that you're in compliance and all these things. All these things are the bedrock of kind of coming up with solutions. And we want to be the technology and the other carriers want to be the technology to be available so that they can apply those solutions, uh, you know, given the needs. So you must be a mind reader because that was my next question to you because we were all talking about CBRS pretty much all day long. Everybody wants to know what CBRS is, what, where is it going to be, is it reality? I just had a great chat with Kevin Hansen from Google who is saying, it's reality, it's here. I've got handsets, I've got this, I've got the network, it's deployed, we're here. What's your take on it, CBRS? I wanna hear all about that. Well, you know, um, so in Build Your Own Coverage, um, you'll notice that we have a BYLC Choices one pager that describes our three programs. So we've got BYLC Generic that's six years old, BYLC Hybrid um, that's three years old, and now we've just released BYLC Express where the customer pays uh, virtually for all the infrastructure and cost. Um, the fourth one is CBRS. And internally, we don't call it CBRS, we call it Private Network. Okay. Um, but the fourth, uh, program is going to be private networks. We've already accepted our first BYOC application in the state of Washington with one of our strategic partners. So we're actively pursuing private network opportunities. Again, it's, it's about problem solving. And literally, the property operator has to make an election. They're going to want cellular connectivity uh, with the carriers. That's a given. Secondarily, though, what are they doing and what do they need to do on property to fix problems or create solutions that avoid problems in the future. And that literally is the opportunity for CBRS. So it is here, it is real, it is starting to emerge. And within the coming years, and I bet probably not more than 18 to 24 months, we're gonna to start to see a dominance of that. We're gonna to start to see that in the smart building space in certain industries, absolutely. Secondarily, then we're gonna see it in the smart city space, towns and communities that are now impaired with the lack of sales tax, um, you know, layoffs and all these things are gonna to have to start to look to solutions in place of those staff, in place of those dollars. And that is gonna come from technology. And so private LTE 
literally, or CBRS, uh, known in some circles, um, is going to be that, that foundation. And so it's got a lot of promise. Uh, we can't wait to see that future. A lot of promise. I love to hear that. Like I said, there's been some question of uncertainty. What is CBRS and where is it going from a reality standpoint? So I've heard it twice now in my two hour session here that we're here and we're using it. So more to come on that. So also, you know, we're talking about all these deployments from a 5G perspective. And when building owners look at this as a dynamic of, you know, we need to build out these networks, it's extremely costly. And Nowadays, the carriers don't fund that, so to speak. They come up with different creative ways to do it. Um, tomorrow on my panel uh, about supply chain, we're going to be talking about how uh, building owners can actually get things financed securely. And there are different options there as far as, you know, whether you do a 3PO model or somebody actually owns and operates the actual system, or if you take it into an OPEX model versus having to come up with that capital expenditure and going forward from a, an OPEX model so they can actually do this over time. And they're financing groups that do that today. Do you work with any of those you know, finance groups? Do you suggest that to customers? And if so, do you have any suggestions or next steps for them for that? Uh, you know, we, we actually work with three continuous partners in, in that space it absolutely is a necessary component because you can have a need, but certainly as you point out, Lori, if you can't finance it, if you can't make a bridge to the other side to deliver that solution and you're impaired by capital, capital shouldn't be that, that resource that you can't get your hands on. So uh, Macquarie Financial, uh, Century Financial, uh, Mitsubishi are all three strategic partners that have been aligned with BYOC for a number of years. They're engaged with the customer. Um, it can come down to a level of, you know, in the, in the old days uh, when my dad worked at IBM, you know, he would go in and try to sell a typewriter, which is very old school, or a copier. And we still have copiers, thank goodness. Um, but the customer said, oh, I can't, I can't afford it, but I need it. And so IBM had financing. Sign here, kind of like Volkswagen signed to drive. You don't owe us anything today. We're going to charge you a payment in 30 days, another payment in 60 days, et cetera, et cetera. And so these three strategic partners really afford and create that opportunity. So if capital impairment is, is risking your project from moving forward, there's absolutely available sources to fix that. Yeah, and I've been very versed to trying to understand that dynamic because it's important. Um, when I used to work for an integrator, I don't know, four or five years ago, I don't know how many projects we would, you know, do a budgetary on. We come up with a cost and the customer would be like, oh yeah, no, DAS is not in our future. We're, we're sorry, this is obviously not something that we want to concentrate mm -hmm. on. But now property owners are saying, DAS has to be in our future. We have no choice. We have to build out these networks and it's still that expensive. How are we going to do this? So it's really great to hear that there are options out there for the end user to be able to do so. Now, another question that I had, which you've already talked about as well, or started to, I wanna hear all about your smart city initiatives because I know clearly inside is important, outside's just as important. So how are you doing there? Well, thanks for asking. Um, you know, we've, we've initiated some smart city projects from coast to coast and with the inclusion of the Sprint family now under the T-Mobile roof, under new T-Mobile, um, we've now got a pretty good consortium of projects. Um, we really start by the basics, Lori, uh, with smart cities. Again, we've talked about goals and objectives. So, you know, we really coach the city into what are your goals and objectives? You know, each and every city that we know and live in has an established brand and an identity. We, we probably don't even think of it that way, but really the only reason that I live in Seattle versus a neighboring city um, could be, you know, completely independent and different from that neighboring city. So when they have their own perspective of their city and their town, and that's why they're incorporated, um, they've got their own ideas of things that they're offering to constituents, uh, the value living in their town or city. So we really work with them on that premise. Uh, we've got a BYOC uh, page checklist for smart cities. Um, they go down that checklist. And the number one item that we drive them to is how good is your forging system? And you'll be surprised at the elected appointed officials. Sometimes they'll have no idea. Others, they'll say, oh, I know where all the dead spots are in town. Others will say, oh, I get so many emails from people complaining 
Um, so it really builds a composite for them. And we have them do a, a town or city drive test to really then open their eyes to say, you need to probably do some homework, city or town. To become smart, you're going to have to be an enabler. And the enabled component is that you have good, robust connectivity and coverage everywhere. So let's start by working on your coverage that you have today. Let's evolve into the deployment of, you know, obviously our wedding cake on 5G. And then you can start to put together all the solutions that you're going to need. And whether that's sensors, whether that's security, whether that's compliance, whatever the future of the business plan is going to be, um, basically the technology has enabled that solution. Nicely put, Luke. I like that. That's great. So, yeah, I mean, smart cities, obviously, is re they're really important. I mean, we have open air mall spaces growing. I mean, we have a lot of areas where people not necessarily write the single second, but will eventually flock to. And, you know, it's, it's a unique challenge because it's building the outside versus building the inside. So, you know, by using, I don't know, smart poles, so to speak, and, you know, putting aesthetically pleasing um, networks together as well. I mean, I know that I get asked that question. What do you do for these open mall spaces? How do you make it look pretty? And how do you address the challenges of, you know, how many people we have that might come in for a concert one night and then the next day it's different. So, yeah, I mean, there's no question, but the questions are always there, right? Uh, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, as we talked about, Lori, it's prescriptive. And really it's, you know, it's how do we apply the technology to the location? What are the needs? Um, you know, destinations and venues are probably our biggest challenge, um, especially when they partner up with three POs and then they bring us a, a really high dollar amount to join because, you know, we're challenged by physically looking at that property and saying that amount of square footage for that customer base. But the fact that they're not there every day, the fact that the uh, location is not, you know, having events 24 seven and in some cases they are, but in most cases they're not. Um, and so it really kind of comes down to what are the needs for that location? And that's where I think, you know, going back to CBRS, I think, you know, destinations and venues are going to have to pull away from the 3PO model. That model really has been kind of broken over the years. The carriers now don't have an appetite or a checkbook to handle that. Um, they are still building and we're still building the outdoors. And we're going to continue to do that, but we're going to, you know, smartly, you know, partner on the indoors. Um, and the indoors from time to time can be a challenge. So that park setting that you described, um, you know, it may be a challenge because we might have to hide the sites. Um, we might have to do a, a blend of things with macro, micro, small cell. Um, we might have to do an ODAS, um, but that might be really in concert with the jurisdiction and or the property owner. Well said again. So you know how involved I am with public safety, right? Just right. Wondering. Yeah. Right. I know that you also talked a little bit about what you guys are doing for those first responders. And that is a passion for me to have conversations about because, you know, obviously we are looking at other carriers that might have something completely different, um, so to speak. Um, what What's T-Mobile doing for first responders? Talk to me a little bit about that. I clearly know, but I want the audience to hear it, if you could, if you might. Okay. So um, as, as we talked about before, we initiated Connecting Heroes. That's, that's for the public safety agencies across the United States to reach out to T-Mobile and for all of their members of the public safety organization to be able to join T-Mobile at zero cost. Zero cost for 10 years of service. Wow. Because we really believe that that's, that's part and parcel to community that's, and community engagement. Now, I think you know this, um, and this year is my retirement year, but you know, I spent 10 and a half years at San Francisco Police Department as a reserve police officer. When I lived in the Bay Area, I was working patrol one to two days a week. So I am, like you, very passionate about public safety. And for the fact that I was a public safety first responder, I was aware of the challenges of coverage, no coverage, because if my two-way radio didn't work, guess what? My mobile device was my backup. And so, you know, public safety and technology have to go hand in hand. We're driving that. We're certainly not part of the first net, which at t got awarded. Verizon's doing something similar. But we believe that we've got, you know, a different opportunity. We've got an opportunity that we can support it um, because the cost, 
and the challenge for, for governments today to fund and budget their public safety organizations is going to be the most challenging probably ever in our lifetime. So, you know, being 50 now, I, I realize that they may have never seen anything like this, especially in my lifetime. So how do we help that? And that Connecting Heroes is our first piece. Secondarily, we're probably going to want to walk, walk through and talk through you know, solutions that can bring in the coverage and connectivity um, at the public safety locations, but we'll get there. I think the first thing is getting the handsets in their hands and the service delivered to them. Absolutely. It's a very serious uh, topic, so to speak. And I'm so glad to see that T-Mobile is taking an initiative to do that, not to actually go backwards. This is being recorded, but I'm pretty sure I just heard your age. Did you just say your age? Mm -hmm. I heard that. We'll have to quiz everybody and see if they were listening. So in addition to public safety and where the FCC requirements are going, I have some questions surrounding the fact that they are eventually going to be looking to have uh, tenants have to be able to um, identify where cellular users are in the case of a, a 911 call. Um, depending on location, it could be floor level, wherever they're existing in that building. And, you know, we know right now that some of these congested areas, you might place a call and it might wind up at a different building down the street just due to the fact that we have those challenges. Um, you know, we talk about Z access and going into the PSAP and trying to understand how that's going to make a play. I don't know if you have any direction there. I know we're a few years off, but you know how these years go by so quickly, right? You just announced your age, although you're really young looking though, I got to say. Nice job. But well, it's not all my hair, thank goodness. And, and, and certainly it's not colored, so that's, a, that's another good thing. Um, but yes, we're, we're going to have to work on locating um, the subscriber, and we're going to have to continue to perfect that. Um, GPS at the cell site, and of course GPS from your phone is going to be the two derivatives that continue to size in that map to make sure that public safety is, is delivered and directed to you when and where you need that. Um, you know, that, that is the subconscious of every customer today. At the moment of need, they want to reach for their phone and know that 911 is going to go through. And so we need to be prepared for that. We need to improve. We can constantly, continuously work uh, from the engineering side. And I think we take on the challenges from the FCC to make sure that the customer's experience is, is improved and better. Um, and we're going to continue to work on that. I don't have too many details specifically, Lori, to share with you, but it's at the forefront of our minds. Yeah. It is. And, you know, like I said, it's coming. I know we have other things right now that we're thinking about, uh, give or take, but, you know, they're announcing 2022, 23. There's a lot of moving parts there, obviously, and it's challenging to understand where that direction is going to go right now. But it's great to hear that you guys are thinking about it. Lori, can I jump in quickly with the question? Hi, Rich. You got a, hi, Rich. Hi, Luke. Um, I, I did pick it up. It was 50. So just so you know. Um, there was a there was a plus in there, but we'll keep going. Oh, okay. Do we have a prize to give people? We'll give you 50. Okay. Um, so, Luke, the question came in from two different people, um, and it's about uh, roaming agreements and interconnection um, for companies that put CBRS networks in and then are looking to, um, you know, sort of interconnect or roam on T-Mobile's network or vice versa. Can you comment on that? Is that an initiative or something that, um, is not has not been decided yet. So we um, so senior leadership uh, empowered two teams within T-Mobile Rich to come up with business plans for private network CBRS. Both of those teams are still ongoing with their business plans, um, but I do believe that at least one business plan will involve some roaming. And we've had conversations with the roaming team. They've been working on it as well as part of one committee. Um, so we do think that we're going to have an opportunity to have signal at the edge, maybe with no equipment on site, um, and literally just you know piping back to us on a roaming component um, with no RAN gear at the at the property location. So I think there's going to be probably at the end of the day probably a bad analogy because I grew up in San Diego and I love Baskin Robbins. So you know they have 31 flavors. I, I think we're going to have several different flavors. Uh, private networks or CBRS. So 
I think you're entertaining a, a, at least two. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, two, three, four years from now, we kind of look back and go, well, we only thought there was going to be one or two. And, and there's several different opportunities. So I, I think the future holds, uh, you know, promise. It's bright. And uh, we're going to lead and follow to where we think it, it could best support the customer. And that may start with Roman. Gotcha. So the other question was, um, I think you answered it during the, the panel, but I think this was, was the question came in afterwards. Um, is the, of course, the BYOC program still exists. And someone asked a question saying that they had heard because of the Sprint um, uh, merger that the um, BYOC program or the decision to, um, you know, give uh, equipment to DAS networks that were um, looking for radios had been put on hold. Is that the case or are you still moving forward on programs to distribute uh, BYOC and to work with uh, customers who have DAS networks who are just looking for a radio source? So uh, the program continues. As you know, we initiated the BYOC Express program, which actually then basically sells the, the RAN gear, the RF, to the customer. They're writing a check or writing a purchase order for it. So we continue to do that. I think we're, we've been over one this year. And I think you know, with the key initiatives of rolling out 600 and finishing that, which we're in the throes of doing within the next coming months, the 2.5 initiative and so on and so forth, it has put BYOC on a lower run, but it hasn't eliminated it. The final frontier will continue for minimum, many, many years to come. So you know, what we do is we kind of take to governance every month the key projects that we have gotten through on the approval process, the budgeting process, and so on. And that is now a monthly process. So most likely somebody's heard that the process has changed. We've gone from a quarterly budget, which originally we went and, and based everything on a, on a yearly decision when we first started the program. Then it went to quarterly, and now we've gone to 30-day monthly. So that's probably the only change. And yes, monetarily, this year, I don't think we're going to get through another 500 projects like we did last year with so many initiatives driving to the end of the year. But 2021 brings a lot of promise. And for the fact that we have so many projects that are, quote, shovel ready, I, I think the business is then going to say, hey, we're now post the year of merger and the number of interesting distractions and things that have happened both stateside and around the globe. And of course, now we're on back into a regular yearly budget. That's the opportunity then that we'll have to backfill and play catch up. And most likely we will, because now everybody's going to say, I need signal indoors, please help. Yep. Gotcha. So Lori, I'm just going to um, say one or two things and I'm going to leave it back to you. I'll send it back to you uh, to finish. Uh, but I just want to encourage everybody to uh, visit our exhibitors and uh, our chat rooms because uh, there are companies that are giving away equipment, DAS systems, um, all kinds of, of different things. Nokia is, is doing a uh, contest for a 20 to 40,000 square foot system. Um, so there are lots of things and lots of reasons to go in, visit the booths and be involved. So if uh, everyone who's listening in and watching uh, would do that. And Luke, you and your team at T-Mobile um, have been great in helping us um, make sure people do that. But Lori, I'm going to turn it back to you from here um, to, uh, to take over and finish. Uh, and thank you both. Thanks, Rich. Great job, by the way. <laughs> thank You're you. You're amazing out there. So, all right, Luke, now that I just had that, I have to go back to my where was I question. <laughs> So one of the questions I did have now that we're going into it, rural markets, yes, really challenging. I absolutely am one to say, being in New Hampshire, I live in a rural market. I live at yeah. the beach. I have no coverage anywhere I go. And I remember when I first started in the industry, oh, long time ago. I'm not going to divulge the time frame though, just like you. But a long time ago, 20 some odd years. I didn't have coverage here, but I still don't have coverage here. What, where is T-Mobile going with a rural divide, so to speak? And what's the game plan? I know probably 2021 and beyond because this year's different, right? But what's the, what, what's the look 
forward to for me so I know my cell phone will work. So if we take you uh, case in point, Lori. So we have worked diligently to publish and post our coverage maps. So anybody can go 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 to T-Mobile backslash coverage. And you can take a look at your gym. Well, maybe not your gym this week, this month. Um, you know, you can look at any and all locations, your home. Um, you can look at your business location. You can look at a geographic route. If you take a certain freeway, you can basically look at coverage at the, at the level of the whole, entire U.S. And what we really want to do is we want to make sure that the customer experience is perfected, as I've mentioned before. The only way we can do that is to be detailed and coverage to people so that they have the impression prior to buying and that once they become a customer and we drove through the end carrier, no contracts. So you can quit, but the only way that we make sure that you don't is that you're happy. And so, you know, for New Hampshire, I would say, let's check your coverage. I would say that adding the 600 land band with, with 5G then may have afforded you more coverage than what you believe you know you have, um, which might be a game changer. And literally we're starting to see that it is because that 600 band is below the original cellular duopoly of our competitors at 800 megahertz. Some of them are in 700, we went to 700, but now with 600 layer, that's the absolute lowest. It's got the best penetration. And we have basically covered the map, the United States map in magenta. Very, 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 very little white space and white space indicates no coverage. So I think you'll see Coverage may have changed for your neighborhood, Lori. And you and I on a sidebar need to look at that because we might have a resolution fixed for you and it's already probably right here in front of us. <laughs> I swear that was perfectly said. Thank you so much. So for those of you out there that are now working at a home and absolutely have the same challenges I have, Luke Lucas, ladies and gentlemen, He's got the map, he's got the map. So tell me a little bit about what I see behind you because I really love the fact that you've got like lights, water, wireless. It's really cool. Talk to me about that. So uh, when I conceived the in-building program, we really thought that it was the fifth utility. Um, and we want to encourage that both from the city and county level at planning. We want to make sure that developers, architects, builders are engaged with knowing and understanding that when and if they build their project and the day that they have the mayor or some congressional member or some senator you know some elected official at the ribbon cutting the one thing that they can't be disappointed about is wireless connectivity and we just found over the years lori that if we started to brand this lights water wireless that people would start to say oh i need to include wireless in my planning so for our smart buildings checklist, different from our smart cities checklist, but our smart buildings checklist, we encourage that. And at the city and county planners level, as I mentioned earlier, we're encouraging the planners to stay on a checklist. When plans come in for plan check, before you issue that building permit, have a conversation over the counter with your client at the city or county level to say, what is your connectivity and how is it? Now, people would say, well, wait, I don't know what my coverage is. Well, yes, you do, because you can go to the internet 24-7. All the carriers have coverage posted. We've challenged the other carriers, so we've encouraged them to improve on their granularity to show the exact coverage for the expectation. And, of course, then the in-building challenges with the construction materials and so on and so forth. My other side is obviously the smart buildings piece, so it all fits together. I mean, this is a long-term plan that we've got that to conquer the indoors, we've got we've got a road to hoe. So we've got our work cut out for us, but we've got to educate people. We've got to coach people. And we've got to make sure that people understand all the tools and the options available to them, some of which may involve us, some of which might not involve us. CBRS, private networks, may not even involve us from the customer level at the end of the day. That's okay with us. At the end of the day, it's all about customer experience. That's for sure. And you know, you definitely bring up a good point, especially on that light water 
uh, lights, water, or wireless. It's the fifth utility. I mean, we hear that a lot. And when there's a building and construction starting in the phases of just designs, if you're not ready to put the DAS system in or the coverage into that building in the early stages, in the beginning, you're going to miss out. Especially right. once you start to see ceilings and walls go in and you start to see that you could have pulled all your fiber and your cables ahead of time to reduce your cost. It's critical. So I know that there's a lot of folks in the audience wondering when do they put a DAS system in? The DAS system needs to be initiated at the start of construction, so to speak, and involve everybody that you can from electric to you know, plumbing to everybody. Involve everybody at the start because it's gonna be critical at some point and it's gonna reduce the cost. So I'm glad you guys say that because it's important. Can I add a footnote to that? Sure can. So, so if you're ready to do a DAS or not, we encourage everyone, and you highlighted this, so I want to just expand on it. So when you're in the planning stages of a remodel, a new construction, uh, move into your new office, uh, move into your new house, if, when, and where you can do a handful of things, these things will provision the future for you to be ready. First, whatever your power requirement is for the project, upscale that and upscale that up front. Second, add as much conduit as you can with pull streams. Even if you're not gonna use it today, you'll use it tomorrow and you'll thank your stars that you did it. Absolutely. Next, add more fiber. Fiber is inexpensive when it's under construction. Have your electricians, have your third party assistance, strategic partners pull plenty of fiber. Excessive fiber is your goal. And last but not least, pull plenty of ethernet. If you've done these four things, power, conduit, fiber and ethernet and your property is prepared you'll be prepared future for any g you'll start with 4g today you'll build your plan for 5g when we get to 6g in 10 plus years you'll be ready for that and when you sell your property which we've been working with two universities to build a, a case study that says real estate with the fifth utility is going to have more value you'll be able to sell at more value so you'll you'll receive that value on the tail end so don't worry about it try to get it financed get it budgeted get it included up front because the long term it's really going to pay out in space there you have it lights and wireless the same they are identical when you have to have a need so that was awesome i love that so luke one last i mean as we're looking at your future it's bright it's magenta where do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself in the future against your competitors? And I love the competitors too because I have to play nice and neutral and all that fun stuff, but I'm curious where you see it. Well, it's fun, it's fun to be driving the space. And, and I truly believe that, you know, you know, when my senior VP first initiated a discussion to entertain my business plan, he said, Luke, you are so far in front of this. We're not even addressing in building and people aren't going to be concerned with in building for some time. I said, I know, Dave, but at the time, you know, right now, we've got to prepare. And the more we can do, the more we can drive. So in true uncarrier fashion, I truly believe that I've been driving the space. But that's okay. If, if other carriers want to plagiarize, borrow, copy, imitate, um, that's okay. Because at the end of the day, it is absolutely connecting to our customers. It's all about experience for us. It is probably for them as well. And as a business owner, as an operator, especially in today's climate, you don't have any idea who's going to come through your doors, whether you're reopening for takeout, whether you're reopening the government on a partial basis just to see customers on a scheduled basis versus what we do in January or February this year before COVID. You've got to be prepared for every single person coming through that door. That involves technology. That involves connectivity. So, I now see a sweet spot after all these years in development and deployment, building the outdoor network. You know, this year is 25 for me at T-Mobile. 25 years. You started at 25? Network. It is 25. It is 25. I have so, a beat. Literally, I do see this as the sweet spot. And there's plenty of time. There's no time for retirement. There's plenty of work to get done and there's plenty of encouragement in the marketplace, as well as 
working even side by side with the other carriers. And really that's where it's gonna boil down to with destination venues, we're gonna have to work and partner with the carriers and involving the strategic partner to make sure that the delivery expectations of covered solutions is there and available for our customers. So a lot of work ahead, Lori. You and I will always be connected, but we'll be continuing to connect with the amount of work in front of us. I love it. And I love this industry so much. It's just exactly what you said right there. Teamwork. Let's get it done. We have a job at hand. Let's figure it out together and let's build on it. There's enough to go around, but let's do it the right way. That's a key too. do it the right way. So okay, last... for a question, I'm sorry, Lori. What was that? Did you get a question? I jumped in for a question. Yeah, of yeah. course. Luke, um, did you talk about the layer cake here um, in, the, in your strategy early on? I did. You did? We, we did early on. I, I love that part of the discussion and also the fact that I think you're right that the BYOC program is way ahead. There aren't. Uh, the other carriers don't seem to be a, as uh, front and forward in helping uh, um, real estate owners get the equipment and put the, the uh, systems together the way you have. But I, I apologize. I love that part of the story. So that's you know why uh, you know why you missed it. It's called the wedding cake now. You probably oh, just it's it's cute. Cute. Layer, layer cake, wedding cake. It's both interchangeable. Yeah. And if anyone wants to see the the graphic, go to www.tmobilebyc.com, and under the resources, you'll find the layered cake. And with all three bands. As you know, and the other carriers are starting to understand as well, it's it's a layered approach. Yep. So, Lori, your skills continue to get better and better at doing this stuff, and and I'm so happy that you're our blog, you're our uh, a podcast partner going Thank forward. Um, yes. We're just about out of time. I just want to make a couple of announcements, if you wouldn't mind. Um, first of all, thank you to Zenfi for being sponsored today, and Luke, thank you for filling in our Facebook. A uh, uh, person dropped out at the last minute. I appreciate your, your filling in. Certainly, you weren't second choice. You did a great job here. Um, the yeah. other thing is that uh, there are, uh, we're having a uh, virtual happy hour um, and that you can go in, get a drink, and go into our virtual happy hour and join the chat rooms. And, uh, you know, the best, next best thing to being at a trade show together and having a drink uh, all in the same room while we do it from thousands of miles apart. Second of all, we pick up uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. with a panel on diversity. Um, obviously, that's a very hot topic, especially in commercial real estate and prop tech. Um, I'm glad we have uh, female partners on, on, this, uh, on, on our podcast and on this panel as, as our interviewer. And so um, also please visit our exhibitors and go to the chat rooms. Um, again, we have the, uh, the virtual happy hour going on right after this. And tomorrow we have the diversity panel. We have another CBRS panel. We have a cybersecurity panel. We have a commercial real estate round table panel. We have a supply chain panel. Um, so I think all of those will be of interest to everyone. Um, today, I think was a great success for the first day for our, uh, our second connected virtual tech event. And uh, Lori, thank you so much for uh, doing this. You've done a wonderful job. Luke, thanks for being with us. Absolutely. And uh, we, so, so connected with Lori, I just want to make sure that you mention that. And Luke, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'd love to have you on the podcast. I can't wait to be back, Lori. Awesome. It's Luke and Lori. We're back. <laughs> Luke and Lori, didn't they go to jail? Oh, that's Lori and someone else. Wait a uh, minute. Lori went to jail? No. No, that's different. That's Luke and Laura. <laughs> Yeah, Luke and Laura. Awesome. The old daytime soap opera. That's, That's right. right. That's right. But thank you again for uh, being a, a wonderful host and a wonderful hostess. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we end day one. Thank you to everybody for who attended. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Luke. Bye, Rich. Bye.